Good morning, everyone. Governor Scott is currently on another call with fellow governors and White House officials, but he will be joining us shortly. I'm Mike Smith, Secretary of the Vermont Agency of Human Services. Today, any Vermonter age 70 and older can receive their first dose of COVID-19 vaccine. Registration opened at 8.15 this morning. Things are gonna be, things have been going well, but please be patient as call volumes are higher than normal. As of 10.05, some have received the message that all circuits are busy. We're working on this, and if possible, uh, please call again. Our wait times have been, on average, about five minutes, and the maximum hold time has been 25 minutes. So far, over 11,000 Vermonters have registered. Nearly one-third of the eligible Vermont population in that age band. So to make an appointment, you can visit the Health Department website, and we recommend that you visit the Health Department rec uh, website at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. Uh, because of the higher call volumes, uh, this is probably the most expeditious way to do it. But if you can't, please call our vaccine call center at 855-722-7878. Just a note for those that have vaccine appointments today, with the exception of the clinic at the uh, Champlain Valley Expo, all vaccination sites are open. However, if you feel uncomfortable driving due to road conditions in your area, you can reschedule. Those who wish to reschedule can do so by calling 855-722-7878. That's 855-722-7878. Again, I would just urge you to be patient. This phone line is also being used today for the first day registration of those that are 70 years old and older. And unlike any other day when getting through would be no problem, phones could be busier today. Do not worry, we will get you rescheduled uh, for an appointment to be vaccinated. There are plenty of slots. The UVMMC clinic at the Champlain Valley Fairgrounds has already been rescheduled. Uh, for appointments throughout the week and, and an additional clinic has been scheduled for Saturday and they are calling those people that were scheduled for today with the date change. As of today, 78,200 uh, eligible Vermonters have been vaccinated against COVID-19. 40,800 Vermonters have received their first dose and 37,000 have received their second dose. Uh, 33,700 Vermonters age 75 and older have made an appointment for at least their first dose through our community vaccine, vaccination program. So far, 51% of Vermonters in the 75 years old and above age group, as well as nearly 850 homebound Vermonters have received their first dose of COVID-19 vac vaccine. We are now beginning to identify homebound Vermonters that are not easily identified through home health agencies. We will continue outreach to hospitals and primary care offices across the state to further identify homebound community members. In the future, we will provide a telephone number to call if you are homebound and qualified to be vaccinated. Uh, but we are using hospital and primary care offices right now to reach out. So if you don't get reached, uh, if you don't hear from us in the next few weeks, uh, we'll provide a phone number that you can call. I believe we have taken a thoughtful approach to this rollout, and we are able to expand opportunities for Vermonters to be vaccinated in proportion to the increased allocation of COVID-19 vaccines. Again. We are currently vaccinating individuals 70 and above, as well as those healthcare workers in Group 1A and homebound Vermonters within the age group. As I mentioned last Friday, we plan to move through the current Phase 3, which is the 70 years old and older that I just talked about, really uh, fairly quickly uh, be before moving on to phase four, Vermonters 65 years old and older. I will have more details about this in the near future. 
Again, we want to extend our deepest appreciation to the many partners that have assisted us and continue to support a successful vaccination program across our state, including hospitals, long-term care organizations, the Vermont National Guard, pharmacies, home health agencies, EMS, area aging agencies on aging, state and local officials, multiple state departments and agencies, and all Vermonters. I just want to say thank you all. Now on another um, completely separate but important subject, on Saturday at the Tallahatchie County Correctional Center in Mississippi, where we have approximately 180 inmates, an incarcerated individual, Cecil Vivian, age 62, died suddenly. Mr. Vivian was serving a 30-year-to-life sentence for aggravated sexual assault. On-site medical personnel and arriving EMS personnel tried to revive Mr. Vivian. An administrative review and medical reviews will be conducted. This involves a review of events leading up to the death, a full review of medical records, and an independent external review of the medical history and circumstances of the death. Next of kin have been notified and processes are underway to follow their wishes. Cause of the death is being determined. It does not appear to be suspicious. More information will be available through the Department of Corrections later on today. I will now turn the presentation over to Commissioner Pichek for his weekly update. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Secretary Smith, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, as you'll see from uh, today's presentation, the favorable COVID-19 trends continue nationally, regionally, and also here in Vermont. The United States continues to see the rapid decrease in cases this week, with the seven-day case rate average falling below 100,000 for the first time in three months. You can see when cases were last averaging 100,000 in early November, it took us 68 days to climb up that peak to early January. However, it has only taken us 32 days to climb down from that peak, falling back below 100,000 cases on average. Again, illustrating just how quickly the cases are continuing to fall across the country. There are certainly a number of explanations for why cases are falling so rapidly. Uh, for one, we're well past the holiday season, which certainly fueled some of the case growth we saw. We've also become more acclimated to safely being indoors during the winter time. Adherence to public health guidelines may be increasing as well. And there's the possibility that either um, natural immunity or immunity from vaccination is playing a role. But whatever the reason, certainly the greatest tool that we have remains following the public health guidelines to keep our cases, our hospitalizations, and our deaths as low as possible. Further, the number of people hospitalized across the country continues to improve, down 45% since its most recent peak. And most thankfully, we are finally starting to see improvement in the U.S. daily death rate, with the seven-day average falling 24% since the most recent peak in early January. And with national cases forecasted to remain low and continue their decline, we should expect to see both case and fatality numbers improve significantly in the weeks ahead. Just like the rest of the country, the Northeast region saw significant improvement this week with 13,000 fewer cases than compared to last, with every state and Quebec seeing improvement compared to last week. This is the first time since November that our regional cases are fewer than 100,000 on a weekly basis. And you can see that we're also reporting fewer cases than we did back during the spring peak as well. Comparing the regional heat map uh, from back during the peak in January to today, we can really see the vast improvement that is occurring in almost every corner of every state in the region. And again, these improvements that we're seeing around us will certainly have a direct impact on Vermont in the weeks and months ahead. And finally, these regional improvements are expected to continue throughout the month of February 
and March based on our forecasting. This past week in Vermont, we reported 814 new cases, a decrease of 142 compared to last week. And as you can see, that has driven continued improvement in Vermont's seven-day case trend, where we have uh, continued to see gradual decreases with the average seven-day rate coming down over 30% from the most recent peak. Although we've only seen gradual improvement in our case rates overall, we have seen much more significant improvement in the number of individuals over 75 in Vermont who are contracting COVID-19. And this has obviously been where our vaccination strategy has been placed over the last number of weeks. As you can see, the seven-day average for new cases over 75 has decreased from about 10 cases a day on average a month ago to 3.29 cases on average today, representing a 70% decrease in this trend over that period of time. Further, since we are seeing less cases in this most vulnerable age group, we are also fortunately seeing fewer deaths week over week in Vermont. Additionally, when compared to the rest of the Northeast on a per capita basis, you can see that we are both much lower in our rates, our fatality rates, uh, throughout 2021. And you can also see that we've seen significant improvement in our rates uh, from the start of the year to now, uh, which is great also. This is a trend that we hope will certainly continue as we vaccinate more and more of our most vulnerable population. Regarding case counts uh, and their geographic dispersion across the state, it's worth mentioning uh, that we are seeing improvement in both Bennington and Rutland counties. However, at the same time, both Franklin and Essex counties are now more clearly standing out as having a disproportionately high number of cases. Again, everyone in Vermont should be vigilant and take uh, the public health guidelines seriously, but certainly these four counties where cases are more elevated than the rest of the state should certainly um, be following the guidance very closely. The estimate of active cases you can see is declining uh, week over week. We now have fewer active cases than when uh, we did during our peak just a number of weeks ago. However, the active case counts do still remain very high relative to the summer and relative to last spring. So again, just another word of caution and vigilance as we're seeing so much other favorable news. Turning now to the Vermont forecast for the next six weeks, uh, we believe that the uh, gradual decreases that we're seeing uh, and that we have seen over the past week has meant that our forecast will also improve slightly. Uh, with this slight improvement, the forecast uh, still does anticipate an elevated number of cases throughout the rest of February. But again, ultimately, uh, the future outcomes that we experience here in Vermont are really uh, a factor of the little things and the big things that we do every day to protect ourselves and our communities. On the hospitalization front, uh, we are seeing improvement lately in the statewide and regional averages with the number of people in the hospital decreasing. And again, this is also true for Bennington and Rutland counties as well. Regarding our hospitalization forecast, we now continue to believe that we have sufficient resources to treat uh, all Vermonters who would need uh, hospital resources uh, in the weeks ahead. Turning to the college restart, this week uh, colleges across Vermont reported 61 new cases on campus. Uh, this is the lowest number of weekly cases since uh, the spring semester began, uh, providing some hope that cases are stabilizing a bit on campus uh, and another good sign for our future. Regarding the pace of vaccine administration, um, the most recent data from the CDC ranks Vermont number two uh, in the Northeast and number 10 in the nation uh, when it comes to the number of people administered the vaccine on a per capita basis. Additionally, we are including another regional graph this week uh, that measures uh, the percent of the population for each state that's fully vaccinated. So in this case has received both of their shots from Pfizer or Moderna. We believe um, this will be an increasingly important metric to keep our eye on uh, as it both incorporates the effectiveness of the vaccination program across all of the states and also the willingness of each state's residents to get vaccinated in the first place and follow through on the requirements of vaccination. Here, Vermont currently ranks number seven nationally with over 5.3% of our population fully vaccinated per CDC data. 
So at this time, I will um, turn the presentation uh, over to Dr. Levine. Today we are reporting 53 cases <clears throat> and one death. Keep in mind that Mondays are usually a fairly low day, especially Mondays that are a holiday, but we'll accept that good news. We continue to report a markedly low percent positivity rate of 1.7 percent, which indicates not only declining seven-day average case counts, but also ongoing aggressive testing. More than 6,000 tests per day were done in the previous week. The decline in cases appears to include Bennington and Rutland counties as well. And as you just saw, Franklin still looks to be on the rise in a unique way. But admittedly, it may be too soon to expect a change yet. We very much appreciate the cooperation and aid of public officials in Franklin County who have heard our call to action and supported it with their own communications. Outbreaks have not been a major feature of this case growth, and very few schools are involved. However, one of the school outbreaks may have spawned two secondary small outbreaks on farms. But the cause driving these cases overall appears to be community transmission, rather than outbreaks, as we have seen in the other counties. And currently across the state, each case has an average of 3.3 contacts for our contact tracing team to interview. The chance for a case to become a contact, uh, sorry, the chance for a contact to become a case is now at 9%, lower than I have seen in some time. The hospitalization data, again, seems encouraging, with 37 hospitalizations reported today though 12 patients in the ICU. Bennington and Southwest Vermont Medical Center continues to see fewer hospitalized COVID-19 patients than they had been over the last several weeks. All of this comes against the backdrop of variant strains in the U.S. In fact, the country seeing these decreases in statistics at a time when the variant strain is becoming more prevalent in the U.S and it's expected to become the dominant strain in the country during the month of March, according to the CDC. Though indications of the variant were found in Burlington wastewater, our latest tests for genome sequencing have not yet detected variants among select samples from COVID-19 positive individuals. We will have new data, specifically more from the Burlington area, next Monday. It's clear that we are now in a race, a race to continue to suppress the virus by adhering even more strictly to public health guidance, avoiding crowded indoor spaces and multi-household gatherings a little longer, keeping our physical distance and masking, even double masking or not in tuck masking, as there will be less chance for air leakage and more protection to the wearer and those around you. See the CDC website for the data and the techniques, which are quite simple. The other participant in the race is the vaccine. As we've stated and has been reinforced today, more vaccine is on the way, and we will achieve our vaccination goals for age groupings and high-risk conditions on a faster time course. We hope when the governor joins us, he'll have more news from the federal government. In this race, Getting people at greatest risk for severe illness or death vaccinated early and suppressing the virus early are both pathways to reducing the impact of the variant strains on our population. The rates with which our first priority populations are taking vaccine are nothing short of phenomenal. Whether we are talking about residents of long-term care facilities, the healthcare workforce, or older Vermonters living in our communities. And a new phenomenon is obvious. 
those who were reluctant to get vaccinated early during their eligibility fit period, but who are now joining in later in the process. This is encouraging. I want to piggyback on Secretary Smith's comments. In the first 16 minutes today, the health department received more than 7,000 calls from people making appointments to be vaccinated. It's understandable that people may experience a long wait time. Some are getting uh, off circuits uh, 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 as the circuits are all busy. We encourage you to go to the website, healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine to make those appointments. We thank callers for their patience. Everyone will get scheduled and there are enough appointments for all. So what are some of the potential benefits to vaccination? For those in long-term care facilities, whose freedoms and quality of life have been markedly reduced throughout the pandemic in the interest of keeping them safe by preventing outbreaks, we are on the threshold of presenting an array of changes in visitation policies, communal dining, and group activities. From an epidemiology standpoint, achieving so-called community immunity or herd immunity is also important. Although that is the one benefit I would like to emphasize the least, as it tells you little about what that means to you yourself. But the combination of natural immunity from being infected, and may you never have to get immune that way, with vaccine-mediated immunity somewhere in the 80% range leads to a better life for us all and less virus around to be transmitted from person to person less chance for further mutations in virus that can lead to more concerning virulent strains. I described at the last press conference the freedom from quarantine being fully vaccinated can mean if one comes into close contact with a COVID positive individual more than two weeks out from your final dose and if you have no symptoms. The governor will describe what we are considering regarding the impact of vaccination on our travel policy and the complex interplay with many state policies that needs to be resolved to formally enact this. And the goal of travel without need to quarantine upon return or entry into the state. Certainly the separation from friends and family has been acutely felt by us all, especially when we were trying to protect the most vulnerable around us. Consider the opportunity to once again dine, engage in direct conversation, enter their homes, hug. And what about gatherings and gathering size? Starting out small with trusted households and other vaccinated people, moving to dining at restaurants, attending movies and concerts, graduations and weddings, eventually larger capacity events in sports and music. All of this awaits over a period of time, certainly through the spring and summer. If we can all just continue on the present course of lowering active cases through adherence to the usual guidance and making our appointments for vaccine when our group is called. Since the governor has yet, yet to arrive, we will uh, begin the uh, questions. Um, thank you. So, Secretary Smith, um, it seems like there's been a, a pretty big uh, response in 70 plus so far. Um, I mean, what, what do you need to see um, from, from that age banding until you, you open up to 65 plus? Well, there has been a tremendous, you know, we've gone, about one third have already registered in the first few hours of uh, the registration. Uh, period in that age band. What we'll do is make sure that they have the slots. There are slots available for everyone that is in that age band. Uh, we also ask that those that haven't registered that are in the 75, so 70 plus, uh, please register. Um, but I think in the next um, week or two, we're going to um, 
be doing some, uh, some evaluation of where we're going to be and probably open up the next band. Uh, you know, we're at 50% of the 75 plus. We opened up the 70 plus. Uh, we've had good response in the 70 plus. So I think very, very shortly, you'll see us announce the 65 plus. Follow up um, about the counties. Um, you know, you, you mentioned Bennington and Rutland, they're kind of on decrease. Franklin, you kind of alluded to sort of why we're seeing cases there, but uh, what, what's happening in Essex County? What, what's driving cases there? Again, no specific outbreaks. We are always cautious when we look at the Essex County data, mainly because of the small numbers that we're dealing with. and. You can affect the impact of the curve uh, with not too many cases uh, because it depends if you're looking at cases versus rates. So I don't want to blow it out of proportion, but of course we're still looking at it with concern. Um, they had been a concerning county a number of months ago and things seem to go very nicely there. So I think some more of the exact same messaging that we've done. You know, constantly we're meeting with uh, community officials, public officials in the regions where we see problems. So if this trend continues in this direction, that will precipitate another one of those. Steve? I'm all set for right now. Maybe come back later. All right, moving to the phone to Stuart, NBC5. Uh, good morning. You, you've kind of touched on this, but I, I, I just like you to address some of the frustration that we are starting to hear about those who had appointments canceled. You've said that, uh, don't worry, there are many uh, appointments to be had, uh, but for those who saw their appointments canceled today due to the uh, storm, what do you, what do you say? I mean, it's unfortunate, uh, Stuart. I mean, weather does intervene on some cases. Um, all vaccination clinics were open except one, uh, Champlain Valley, that's run by UVMMC. Um, you know, they made the decision to, um, uh, to delay and to cancel that appointment. All I can say is those will be scheduled within a week rescheduled within a week in order to, uh, to accommodate those people. A lot of them were second doses as well, and I understand the frustration there, but um, one, only one clinic has been canceled. It was the decision of the University of Vermont Medical Center to cancel that. Um, I, you know, looking outside, I think the other clinics were, um, were correct in continuing on with the clinics. So the vast majority of clinics are open. There is one that's closed. All of those people will be rescheduled uh, this week and with a special um, clinic on Saturday. Okay. Uh, and while I have you, so how far out are you making an appointment for the 70 plus people? People who call today, get an appointment today, can, uh, how far out is the actual injection? And what is the role of the pharmacies in this? Is it preferable to, you know, to try to go through Walgreens versus the state side, or what's your guidance there? Well, I mean, the guidance is that any place that you can get, um, go to that moves it in. I, I don't have, per, Stuart, I don't have precisely the date that we're going out to, but I would assume it's not too far out uh, given the slots that we have available and giving the group that we have right now, and it's a fairly small group, about 32,000. Uh, Vermonter, so I, I imagine it's not too far away, and plus we'll be opening up 65 and above pretty soon as well. Hey, here's my advice. Um, we are in cl close coordination with Kinney's, Kinney Drugs. It, you have a link on our website where you can go to Kinney's, Kinney Drugs in order to look at their available slots. Um, Walgreens is a federal program that is a little bit more complicated because it doesn't, it's not coordinated with us in a way that the Kinney drug program is. But at, nonetheless, their website is uh, coordinated, uh, is on our website, and you can link to Walgreens from our website. Nonetheless, I would, I would peruse all, all available sites uh, in order to schedule an appointment. 
obviously we have the most dosage, we have the most sort of coverage in, in Vermont uh, with uh, available clinics. But I would urge all Vermonters that are 70 plus uh, to look at all options that are out there right now. All right, thank you. Lisa, the ballot reporter. Good morning, Secretary Smith. I'm hoping you will pass this question on to the governor and to um, Secretary Moore. Um, given the focus on childcare in Vermont, particularly during the pandemic, I want to make sure you're aware of a situation in Waitsfield involving Neck of the Woods Child Care Center. This was a designated remote learning hub site last fall and had the ability to take care of 30 children. They've been fully operational and working to expand their programs while also working to install a public water system, which is required by federal public water system mandate. Despite their best efforts to move quickly to get the water system installed, it will occur in June, They've been told that their deadline runs out at the end of the, this month and they need to reduce programming, cut their numbers and take childcare away from local families until the water system is installed. Neck of the Woods is fully subscribed with a long waiting list. Given the state of emergency, given that the state of emergency is still in effect, why is this critical facility in our community not being provided more dedicated support from the state? Yeah, I'll uh, thank you for the question. I'll go to uh, Secretary Moore. Um, Secretary Moore, do you want to take a stab at that? Yes, I'm, I'm happy to, and Lisa, I'm happy to, to have uh, our technical program staff follow up with you offline. Um, the, the Neck of the Woods Child Care Center had been operating under a temporary license for a period of, of more than six months at this point, um, and we've been working with them throughout uh, to come up with a permanent public water solution that meets some really important health standards. And so appreciating very much what you're saying about the, the need for childcare. Um, this is an area where we've dedicated extra resources at the agency uh, to help these programs navigate uh, those regulatory processes. Uh, my understanding is we are very close, if not there, with the Neck of the Woods Child Care Center, um, but at the same time, can't responsibly sacrifice the need to ensure high quality drinking water for, for our youngest uh, citizens of Vermont as well. Thank you for that. I understand that they operated this summer using bottled water. Is there no workaround to use bottled water and or is there a way to not count, not start counting the six months until the state of emergency ends? Uh, so bottled water is a temporary solution and, and the, the challenge here is, is one of dueling timelines. Um, we don't like to see systems stay on bottled water. Uh, any longer than absolutely essential, in part because it's, it's a complicated management system. Um, and as I said, believe, believe we're very close, if not already there with Neck of the Woods, and I'm happy to, to follow up with you offline with some additional detail. Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, and so do the parents in our community. I will now turn it over to the podium to uh, Governor Scott, who will give us an update on his um, meetings with other governors and White House officials. Thank you, Secretary Smith, and good morning. Uh, apologies for my delay again, but as was noted, I just got off another call with the National Governors Association and the White House regarding COVID strategy. So, uh, more good news. Uh, first, we learned that nationally, uh, weekly allocation will once again increase, this time from 11 million to 13.5 million, which is uh, an increase of 2.5 million doses. That equates roughly uh, to about 2,500 doses for Vermont every single week. So we should be seeing that uh, this next week. So that's, uh, that's great news. Uh, we also received an update on Johnson & Johnson. Uh, it's still expected the FDA will grant emergency use authorization by the end of the month, uh, but time will tell. But if approved, J&J uh, &J will begin distribution immediately, including several million right away, and more importantly, 100 million uh, of these they've committed to uh, by the end of June. So that is uh, substantial, uh, and that would mean a lot for Vermont as well if they continue to distribute. Uh, per capita as they have been. Uh, we also heard uh, that the pharmacies and FQHC uh, will increase uh, their allocation 
nationally from, I think I mentioned this last week or the week before, uh, they had a program that started with one million. Uh, they're increasing that program to two million, uh, and that'll begin this week, uh, which is good news. I mean, we want more vaccine. We want more uh, to be distributed, but there are a number of concerns by many governors uh, about how this will work out. This the pharmacies are out of our control in some respects, um, so. Uh, that's been a concern. Uh, there were a few questions on that at the end, and they said that they would get back to us, um, and again, with further information. But that looks like that's going to happen at this point. Uh, they also wanted to forewarn us right now, immediately, uh, about um, their concerns about logistics uh, and the weather uh, that we're seeing throughout the nation. Uh, they're working hard to de-ice planes as we speak and make sure that distribution is on track. But they said to be prepared. Uh, there may be some, uh, some cancellations uh, or at least uh, uh, some postponements of, uh, of some of the vaccines into different states. I don't know how that will affect us, uh, but stay tuned. Uh, they just wanted to give us a heads up on that. So again, um, it's uh, good to have this productive conversation with the White House and being in touch and uh, we appreciate that. So uh, next, as Secretary Smith, I think, discussed today, uh, this marks an important milestone for us as we move into phase three, those 70 and over. And as a reminder, anyone in phase two, the 75 and older population, if you haven't signed up yet, you can still do so. And we would like to advocate for you to do so. Uh, we expect to move through phase three quickly uh, and then open up to the 65 plus uh, phase. And after that, phase five, uh, which, is, uh, which is those with certain health conditions that put them at greater risk if they contract COVID-19. Uh, as you know, the vast majority of Vermonters uh, who have, have succumbed uh, to uh, COVID-19 have been over 65. So by prioritizing this population, We'll save lives, which is our top priority, and we believe this will get us back to normal faster. And with the added uh, vaccine supply on the horizon, it won't be long before we're open to the general population. In the meantime, I want to, as always, encourage Vermonters to not let up, meaning follow the health guidance, wear a mask, keep your distance, and avoid crowds. Our, tens, uh, our trends are moving uh, in the right direction. Uh, but the smarter we are, the faster we'll see our hospitalizations and deaths drop. And we can open up our schools to in-person instruction, which we know is critical to the well-being of our kids. And we'll be able to, once again, turn the spigot in other areas as well. On that note, as we mentioned last week, the CDC recently came out with new quarantine guidance for those who've been fully vaccinated. Uh, we've been reviewing their recommendations and are working to update our state guidance to reflect these changes, including what it means for vaccinated Vermonters when they, they're a close contact or traveling. We expect to have further details on Friday, uh, but there's still many details uh, we're trying to work out. And we know there will be a lot of what ifs um, that will come as a result. So I wanna be clear, this will be very narrow at first, but we hope to announce changes at Friday's briefing that will allow more mobility for Vermonters. But uh, so stay tuned for that. And with that, we'll get back to questions. All right, next up we have Mike, the Islander. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, <clears throat> Governor Scott, Governor Cuomo was apparently being caught for faking uh, or not reporting accurate death numbers and uh, making them more favorable to him. <clears throat> there are calls for his Emmy Award to be revoked, canceling his book, book tour and beaching him. Wondering your thoughts on that. And how do Vermonters know that our state numbers are in fact accurate? What, yeah. what do you have for independent backup for your numbers uh, to, to confirm yeah, what's that, being that, reported? That's... Um a bit more complicated in New York, I believe, um, but we've been trying to be transparent in Vermont and listening the deaths as they come. 
I might have to ask uh, Commissioner Levine if he has anything more on that, if there's anything different that we're doing. But, um, but I believe uh, the health department is, is reporting the deaths just uh, the same way we have from the beginning. Uh, there's no attempt to, to uh, I guess, uh, be less than transparent on that. So I don't know if there's anything else you can add, Dr. Levine. Yeah, we've been very transparent uh, all along throughout this. We also closely coordinate with our sister department in the Agency of Human Services, Dale, who have regulatory uh, province over all of the long-term care facilities and have an, a, a greater awareness as well of everything that goes on there. Uh, we closely coordinate all of our outbreak management with them, closely coordinate our statistics with them and with the knowledge that uh, they can help support facilities when staffing becomes an issue as well. So uh, I think we have checks and balances built in. Um, and frankly, I can say we have, we've had no reason to hide any, uh, any numbers. Um, there was no motivation you know, from uh, a political or uh, health standpoints to, to do such. Okay, thank you. Uh, Secretary Smith, or maybe Governor Scott, um, you frequently talk about how important it is or how improper it is for uh, people to cut the line and for hospitals and others to allow coworkers, friends to slip into the line, get shots when they're non-essentials and not entitled. And you talk about investigating cases. Wondering what you have found in all these various investigations and reports that you've received Anybody going to be prosecuted? Um, uh, any hospital or outlet being punished in any way? Are there any real ramifications for cutting the line? And uh, I'm just, we continue to get reports on misconduct. I just got alerted to a major group employed at a large hospital getting vaccine shots. None of these employees even deal with medical patients. As a matter of fact, their office is not even on the hospital campus, but yet the hospital management, wink, wink, nod, nod, said that these employees are essential and needed to have shots, even though they're not even close to serving patients. Um, you know, are there any rules or ethical standards that hospital management has to follow in Vermont, or are there no ramifications for them turning a blind eye? And what's the attorney general doing about this, you know? Yeah, yeah. again, uh, from the very beginning. Uh, first of all, we want everyone uh, to be vaccinated uh, as soon as possible. That's the only way we're going to get through this. Um, we, uh, we had expectations in the beginning as to who should receive the uh, vaccinations. Uh, we had came up with this banding approach uh, for uh, the second phase. Uh, the first phase, 1A, was uh, a little bit out of our control. We tried to make sure that we uh, place guidance so that uh, they understood what our expectations were, but it wasn't as clear uh, to some, apparently, as it should have been. Uh, so we've uh, since then come up with more clear guidance. I think Secretary Smith has spoken to them directly, and, uh, and I would be surprised if that was still happening. Uh, although, you know, once you, once you administer the first shot, and we need to make sure that they get the second shot, even if it wasn't uh, you know, from our standpoint, appropriate uh, for them to, to be there. We want to make sure that they uh, get that second shot uh, so that we take care of that. So, uh, Secretary Smith, anything to add? Just, Mike, we, um, wherever we heard of instances like that, we stepped in. Uh, we have issued three what are called health alert notifications that talk about the guidance uh, in 1A, uh, but it all comes down to people following the guidance that we issued in that 1A category. We also have uh, sent out uh, various new guidance uh, to make sure that people clearly understand, and we have urged from the podium as we have urged uh, people that are quarantining, uh, that are coming into our state to quarantine, um, that you know you can you can game at the system, you really can. 
we urge you not to. And please don't, because you're taking a shot away from somebody that really needs it. As we said, 90% of our deaths have happened at 65 uh, and older. And we want to make sure that those 65 and older have those shots available to them. So um, we believe education and re-education and re-re-education is the best way to go. And hopefully um, everybody has gotten the message now, uh, given all the uh, emphasis that we've put on the guidance. But isn't there a big difference between the hospital turning a blind eye, knowing that nothing's going to happen to them, and maybe Joe Sixpack trying to cut the line? I mean, we, yeah. we understand maybe some residents want to cut the line, but when a hospital should be following this thing, and they're not, in this latest case that was reported to me yesterday, I mean, it just seems like the state's not doing anything. Yeah, I, I would contend that the bulk of uh, people that have been getting vaccinated um, have been qualified to get vaccinated under 1A. I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not naive. There are probably some people that have gotten vaccinated for two reasons. One, they have cut the line, or two, that at the end of the day, there was extra dosage, and instead of wasting that dosage, they used that uh, to vaccinate people that were available. Um, those two areas are, are, are permissible. And I don't want to, I, I don't want to send out the message that you will be prosecuted for making sure that you get vaccine into somebody's arms if you have extra dosage at the end of the day. I think it's, it's important that we don't waste dosage. But I understand what you're saying, Mike. Did some people cut the line? Yes. Did some, did some people may have facilitated that? Maybe. And, um, I, but I'm confident that we're starting to crack down on that in a way that's meaningful now. Okay. Maybe we'll follow up offline then with you. Thanks. This is a question that is actually kind of related to what you were just talking about, Secretary Smith. It's a email from a viewer that we wanted to ask you about. Um, they say they were at the pharmacy in Walgreens in St. Albans, um, standing next to an older gentleman, and the pharmacist asked him if he wanted to receive a COVID-19 vaccine because they had extras. Uh, he declined, said he already got his first dose. And then at this point, the person behind him asked if they could have the vaccine. The pharmacist said no uh, because... He's not allowed to give them to anybody over 75. Um, he didn't want to lose his job. And this person says they even offered as far as to come at the end of the day and meet them back by the dumpster. Obviously, that didn't happen. But I was wondering if you could comment on these situations. I know you sort of just did there, but these situations where people are kind of having to decide whether to throw out the vaccine or give it to somebody fearing their own employment. Obviously, the State doesn't have control over sort of who gets hired and fired at Walgreens, but I'm just wondering if you could sort of talk about that a little more. I'll let uh, Secretary Smith answer, but but again, I, I want to reiterate what I said before about my concern and other governors' concerns about increasing this program, uh, doubling the size of the program where they get an extra million doses this next week. Uh, it takes things out of our control. You know, we have some control now because we're doing it by age banding. Uh, ever since 1A, we've gone to phase two, we'll go into phase three, four, and uh, we know who's getting uh, those, uh, uh, those shot, shots, those vaccinations. Um, we're not as, uh, as clear in some respects as to who it is in uh, some of the private uh, facilities. So again, we wanna have partnerships, we, we utilize them and we're thankful for that. Um, but, um, but the way we're doing it now uh, with our age banding uh, is working. Thanks for the question, I really appreciate it. Um, we do send out guidance on minimizing vaccine doses, uh, minimizing vaccine waste at the end of day doses. And that applies to all 
uh, facilities, including the federal pharmacy uh, uh, as well. Now, we don't have as much control over that as we do with other facilities, but each facility has to sort of um, have guidelines that, cor that sort of correspond to our guidelines, and we have those guidelines right now that we send out to these various um, entities, and it's prioritization for using multi-dose vials on site. One is that if you have somebody on your list that you can call in, that's in this case now, 70 and above, that you can call in on your list uh, and bring that person uh, in, uh, that's, the, that's the next priority. Uh, other priorities are other prior phases of Vermont eligibility, for example, healthcare workers or first responders with direct patient care and staff and residents of long-term care facilities. And again, Vermonters uh, 75 and older and 70 and older now. And then in, if, if that fails, then uh, the next plan phase of eligibility is the next phase. If it happens to be 65 or 70, um, and now it's 65, that next phase is the next uh, phase that you go to. And then lastly, and only lastly, would you go to somebody that isn't in the qualified eligibility? But everybody's been instructed, do not waste any dosage of the vaccine. So if that has to go into an arm of somebody that is not qualified, that is better than wasting the dosage of the vaccine. Thank you. Greg, the county carrier. Thank you, Rebecca. Good afternoon, Governor. Um, we're hearing from people who are trying to sign up, 70 plus age group, hearing the same concerns that we heard several weeks ago in the 75 plus was attempting to sign up. Telephone lines are flooded uh, to the point that people are, are just being disconnected, not even being put on hold. Is this the same system that was rolled out for the 75 plus? And, and why haven't some of these basic issues like having a shared email address been fixed? Um. I'll let Secretary Smith answer, but but again, I just want to uh, say again what uh, what I heard this morning. Um, we knew, uh, you know, there is uh, pent up demand. Uh, a lot of people wanting to make sure they make their their appointments. Um, we've already signed up in a matter of uh, two or three hours. We signed up 10,000 people, about a third of the population with this in, within this age band. I think that's doing pretty well. Um, it looks like if we keep this pace up, uh, we'll have everyone signed up within the age band within a couple of days. So I, I don't think that that's a failure. Uh, I think that that, uh, and I know there's some frustration. I know people are waiting, but when this clears up, um, we'll, uh, we'll have signed up uh, a number of people, uh, my, I would predict, over the next couple of days. Secretary Smith. In one hour, we had signed up 7,000 people. In just before I came in here, we had signed up 11,000 people. Um, we this is moving quite rapidly at quite a clip in terms of signups for this. We have 32,000 people in this age group. We're over one third done in the first few hours of uh, this sign-up period. I would call that a success. Um, and we have two avenues in which you can sign up. You can sign up online, and again, you will. You can hit the um, a button to sign up if you are signing up two people, or you can call in. Typically, what we find is when we have a large volume, and we have over 300 call takers online taking calls. Typically, when we find the first few hours, it is going to be jammed, and then we find that it subsides uh, quite substantially in the afternoon hours or the, the next day. But certainly, um, you know, something's going right because we're, we, we've gone through almost one third of our population already in terms of signups. And I figure by the end of the day, we'll be at least halfway through it. Um, so um, 
you know, I, th this is a major call volume coming in, major online volume coming in, but people are getting signed up. Is the state trying to take care of the issues like uh, a sharing of an email address or, uh, you know, telephone lines just being so blocked that they can't even take calls put, put on hold? Yeah, I mean, we've been following the t wait times, as I said, as of 10.05, the wait times, um, we had circuit issues that we're meeting with the, um, with the carrier about. It's not the state, it's the carrier on this one about. But nonetheless, if you call back, the wait times have been fairly minimal uh, getting through. Second of all, we have urged people to use the website. And thirdly, we have added that button that I talk about in terms of the ability to press that button and and add a partner um, in the same household on that. Okay, I'm, I'm told that button wasn't working, but obviously I'm under 70, so it wasn't me personally. Um, moving on, uh, we're still looking for the list of outbreaks, but I'm, I'm told that at least around uh, the Franklin County area, there's a number of cases that are, are being attributed to funeral services uh, in the activities around those types of events. Uh, looking to see if this is true and also, you know, is the state looking at any uh, guidelines, added guidelines to uh, protect people that are, are trying to mourn? I'll uh, ask Dr. Levine to take that question. Yeah, first off, uh, we're not aware of a major outbreak related to a funeral recently. There have been a number over uh, many months, uh, but not recently. And uh, with regard to protection uh, regarding a funeral, um, the guidance really doesn't change from what we tell people to do every day, um, with one exception, and that's, of course, there has to be adherence to guidance regarding if it's an indoor facility, the size of the crowd that would be permitted in uh, regarding the capacity of that facility and the size of the place to accommodate the number of people. Um, but otherwise, uh, obviously, people in mourning can gather in family units who are all exposed to one another every day of the week and seat together, but they should still be physically distanced from other family units, and everyone should be masked. Um, those things really go without saying, uh, no matter what the circumstance, uh, even at a funeral. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Governor, and look forward to uh, getting that list of out uh, outbreaks. Thank you for your time. Pat, WCAS? Hi. We're getting reports that a growing number of students on UVM's campus are in quarantine right now after being potentially exposed to COVID. I'm wondering what percentage of the new cases in the colleges that we saw last week are at UVM and are any of the samples be that are being tested for the variants from UVM students given that their campus is in Burlington? Yeah, you heard earlier that Commissioner Pichek had in the range of 60 students in the course of a week across all campuses. And um, I can't give you the exact number of UVM, but it's a smaller proportion of that. I do know that um, student cases have spanned uh, the general campus as well as the uh, one or two of the athletic teams as well. In terms of the variant cases, we have sent some from Burlington um, and we're getting uh, results on them next week. We have also sent from Norwich. None of them have turned positive for the genome sequencing. So they've all been the standard, if you will, uh, COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 virus. Just to clarify, when you say you have sent some from Burlington, do you mean from UVM or just Burlington generally? Burlington generally, but I believe they include UVM as well. The thing about UVM is it, it's not showing a, um, one of the criteria we use for how we select 
and prioritize genome sequencing samples, which would be an outbreak out of control, uh, which would be um, a transmission pattern that seemed different than normal uh, in terms of an accelerated transmission pattern or in terms of a symptom complex that would be unexpected. So it hasn't met those criteria. Uh, obviously, we added in a final criteria last week, which was if wastewater sampling had shown any uh, positives. So for that reason alone, that would qualify. Got it. Second question, and I'm not sure how much you're going to be able to follow up on this today, but I'm going to ask anyway. Um, you briefly mentioned long-term care facility guidance changes on the way. Can you preview for families who are really eager for that, what that might look like? Yeah, I think we're going to actually preview that much more thoroughly on Friday, so I'd ask if you could uh, respectfully wait until that time. But the things I mentioned in my opening comments are all being uh, considered, obviously. It's really trying to return residents of those facilities to a lifestyle they were accustomed to pre-pandemic. Thank you. Joe, the Barton Chronicle. Um, I guess it's afternoon. Um, I am curious, last week, um, Dr. Levine, spoke about um, the lack of a um, influenza outbreak that would normally be occurring at this time of year. Um, is that something that um, has been delayed? Um, might it still be coming? Or um, are there reasons that it might not be happening? that are related to precautions that are being taken for other things? Or was the vaccination program just that good? I think uh, Dr. Levine obviously will answer that, but I think you hit the, the nail on the head in some respects. Uh, we have increased vaccination to, for the flu this year, which is good news uh, as well. The masking, the washing of hands, the social distancing and so forth and so on all leads us uh, to better performance in that area. That's living. It's 100% due to the increased vaccination. Vermonters had a great rate this year and should continue it every year. No, it's a little bit tongue in cheek. Uh, but we did have a great rate this year. Still could be greater, uh, and it's not too late because part of your question was is it going to be delayed? You know, usually the peak is a little beyond where we are now, but it's hard to have a peak when you don't have almost any disease activity. We're seeing it very sporadically in Vermont. Uh, at the Friday press conference, I showed the slide of syndromic surveillance, which is how many people are presenting to urgent care or emergency settings with appropriate symptoms of flu or COVID. And it was very, very, very low. So we certainly don't even see a lot of people presenting with symptoms who are testing negative for the flu. They're not even presenting with the symptoms. So, Based on Australia's experience, which was to not really have much of a flu season and certainly not a huge peak, we would hope that the Northern Hemisphere can replicate that. Um, and as the governor and you have both stated, so many of the habits that we've had to adopt as part of our daily living are really working in our favor when it comes to all respiratory viruses, including the flu. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, another long-term care facility question. I noticed that uh, previously in, in Commissioner Pacheck's slides, he included a, a, a slide about the cases in the long-term care facilities, and I didn't see that one. And this is, is this really good news that we're talking about here? Um, and you're, you're getting ready to talk about opening them up in, in some way, shape, or form. And does that mean that things are going really well in them? I, I'd say the simple answer is yes, but uh, I'll let Commissioner Pichek elaborate. Yeah, thank you uh, very much for the question. So if you go on the online version of our full presentation, we do have the weekly outbreak uh, slide, Wilson. I think the 
number of outbreaks was four this week, down from five last week. Um, so the number of outbreaks continued to um, decrease. The size of the outbreaks are relatively small compared to what we experienced before. Um, but if you also remember from last week's presentation, we talked about the decline overall in cases in long-term care facilities. So those um, have uh, come down quite a bit since December. Um, and then uh, we're also obviously seeing a decrease in the cases generally over age six, uh, over age 75 as well. But many of those um, individuals are in long-term care facilities, uh, creating that uh, pretty significant decrease in cases. So it is good news, though. Yes, for sure. And, you know, and we pointed out that the fatality rates have decreased, you know, over this period of time as well. Those are our most vulnerable Vermonters. And, you know, as we protect them, um, we expect those fatality rates to continue to stay low. Okay, great on that one. And then another one for the governor. It's, it's, things are rather optimistic here this morning, which is really nice. Um, but thinking about going forward, you know, after COVID, do you think you might find some way to continue giving us reporters from across the state access to you the way you have been doing, what, for 11 months yeah. now? I mean, as somebody who used to crowd into those news conferences, you know, 15 people in the uh, in your office in the state house for 45 minutes, which were pretty curt, you know, you did what you had to, and then everyone went on. But now everybody is getting access to the top people in government. Have you given any thought to how you might continue that, if at all, once COVID is over. Yeah, first of all, looking forward uh, to COVID being over, uh, number one. Uh, number two, uh, we have considered that. And, and I think I've remarked uh, in some of these uh, media briefings before, but one of the silver linings that we found uh, is the access uh, and hearing from all parts of the state. Uh, Wilson, you you, uh, you remember, I mean, it wasn't as though uh, we, uh, we made sure that only a certain number of people came in uh, to the press briefings, but it typically w were the ones that were in the Montpelier area, in the central Vermont area, that came to the press briefings. And I think uh, what we found is we're hearing from all parts of the state now, and we're having access and questions, and, and we're getting to know what um, the people in those, uh, those communities are thinking. So uh, I, I would expect, uh, I'm not committing to this, but. I would expect in the future uh, that we'll do something similar to this, maybe not as long, maybe not uh, multiple days, but certainly uh, we want to make sure that we continue uh, to, to you know, reach out uh, to those other parts that feel as though they're left behind and they don't have a voice and, and we don't know what they're thinking and we're not reacting to what they're thinking either. So we want to be able, uh, be able to bridge that gap. Um, okay, great, thank you. Dr. Levine, you said that there had been some outbreaks in Franklin County School. Uh, do you think you could name the schools or school districts that have been experiencing outbreaks? Uh, the one that's of, of size that would allow me to name it would be uh, Enosburg. I believe the website will show uh, a dozen cases. Okay, yeah, I, mean, I meant like attributed directly to the outbreak. Yeah, uh, but that's still good to know. Um, and with um, with these outbreaks, you know, obviously you said that school transmission is not a main driver of cases. This, this particular instance seems to make it be a little different than that or an exception to that rule. Is there any reason that you guys are investigating as to why it could have happened? Um, something different about particular instance? Yeah, so um, our outbreak prevention and response team is always involved in all of these and um, work with the superintendents and other school officials to help mitigate the situation. I'm going to stand by what I've been saying all along, which is in Franklin County, there's a larger amount of community transmission of virus occurring. 
uh, which makes it show up in all facets of life, whether it would be in a healthcare facility, in a workplace, in a school, um, and that's what this reflects. I don't want to blow it out of proportion uh, because it's really the same phenomenon that's occurring. All right, um, yeah, and just a quick second question. Um, Mike uh, Smith has been given the numbers of, uh, you know, people within specific groups that have been vaccinated throughout this, but that's still not presented on the Department of Health website. Do you guys have any plans to kind of give a, a, a page to the dashboard just so that people can kind of evaluate, like, the progress that Vermont is making on these different age bands? Yeah, there is, there is a part of that vaccine website that actually allows you to see sex breakdown, age breakdown, uh, racial breakdown uh, of all the people who've been vaccinated. So I, I think what you're asking is, is there, unless I'm misinterpreting your question. It's, it's similar, that is true, but I mean, for example, um, the rate by age and sex, um, you know, has 75 plus and then 60 to 74. So I couldn't evaluate the progress of specifically 70 and older age bands, for example. Ah, okay. It also only gives the percent vaccinated, not the percent registered, which would also be nice to have, but you know, I understand that some of the reporting can be complicated. No, and I, I can understand where you're coming from because obviously somebody in the 60 to 74 group right now would have been vaccinated at the long-term care facility they're living in. Anyone from today onward could have been vaccinated as part of the 70 to 74 age band. So uh, what you're asking for is to uh, have us break that down into several categories, 70 to 74, 65 to 69, right? Yeah, essentially. Yes. I can bring that back and we can see if we are actually already doing it or and we just haven't been able to show you the way to access it or if we need to provide more. We'll get back to you. Okay, thank you. Hi, um, I had a question about the, the potential authorization of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and you know, if and when that happens, how the state will look at distributing that, that third vaccine um, along with the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine. Obviously, the Johnson & Johnson one is only one dose and um, some of the preliminary data indicates I think it's about 66% effective compared to the higher effectiveness of Moderna and Pfizer. So I'm just wondering if you know, how the state is going to take into account um, data about its effectiveness and how it's distributed or if they'll recommend that to other, to different groups, just sort of sort of some of the logistics around that uh, potential vaccine. Yeah, Liam, we're uh, working out those details as we speak. We've been talking about it for quite some time, but we don't know exactly when and how much and so forth. So we're getting more details, as I mentioned uh, earlier, from the White House and the administration. So. Uh, and knowing that it's, it could be coming soon, um, we're, again, working on these uh, as, as we speak. Um, I will also, you know, I know, it, and Dr. Levine can uh, certainly elaborate uh, much better than I can, but um, we talk a lot about, I mean, I've heard you say the 65%, um, but it's, you know, 95%, I believe, 95% effective uh, in terms of protecting you from hospitalization or death. Um, so that's a pretty high percentage and much higher than even the flu vaccines and so forth. So I think people should keep that in mind, single dose. And, and we don't know yet, I don't believe, uh, the effectiveness on some of the variants. So that could change as well. So we'll learn more as the, uh, and I'm sure the, the uh, FDA is going to be asking all these questions as well. So we'll get more of the details as they contemplate whether to authorize this emergency use or not. Dr. Levine. Yeah, I think you pretty much nailed it, Governor. 
I think the 65 or 66 percent was a worldwide experience, and when they broke it down to U.S., it was in the 72 or 74 percent range. Uh, but the governor's correct that it depends what outcome measure you're hanging your hat on. If the outcome measure is just, did you get any symptom of COVID uh, if you were in the vaccine group, that's the number that you've been hearing. But if you really ask about the outcome measure that most vaccines are measured against, and certainly the flu shot, we, we live and die by this every year, is will it prevent you from getting major symptomatic illness that could put you in the hospital or cost, cost you your life or who knows what other bad outcome? And all of the vaccines are compared on that, uh, including AstraZeneca, which hasn't yet made it to approval in this country. And they all measure pretty equally across the board at a much higher rate than the 72% uh, for preventing that serious outcome. So uh, again, we're not trying to spin this in any way. It's just what are the outcomes that really matter and why would you get a vaccine in the first place um, to protect you? So that's, that's sort of the bottom line in that regard. We'll, of course, uh, be able to message that far more effectively when it actually goes through the approval process and uh, makes it to the finish line. And we hear the uh, exact parameters that the FDA and then the CDC are operating under as well with regard to special features of this vaccine in either direction, uh, where it may be more or less effective whether it has to do with serious disease, whether it has to do with a special subpopulation, whether that be racially determined or age determined, whether it has to do with a subpopulation of chronic diseases, or whether it has to do with the variant strains. So more, more questions than answers, uh, but you know, February 26th and 7th are not very far away, so we should have them very soon. Thank you. Um, and then a question for Mike Smith. Um, at the beginning of the press conference, you mentioned that a, an inmate in Mississippi had died. And um, I expect that DOC will have more information later. But um, I'm wondering, you know, as, as head of the Agency of Human Services, which oversees DOC, we've now seen several deaths of Vermont inmates um, over the last few months. I know there were two in December, at least, and one was um, at also at Tallahatchie. And so are, are you concerned about uh, just the, you know, even though there have been several now, are you concerned about that? And are there any sort of overarching trends that you're seeing that um, need to be addressed? Thanks for the question, Liam. Um, the, the second death that you're talking about uh, was in December. Um, and my understanding, the autopsy report has come in, it was due to a heart condition. Um, this one we don't know yet. We will do the investigation. Um, there will be continued investigation on that. Uh, so far, not a trend, um, but every death is a concern of mine, uh, especially in a facility. And I'll wait to see the uh, internal investigation on this. Plus, we have several external investigations that have to happen on this uh, before making a final uh, determination. But right now, it does not look like this death is suspicious. But I will hold judgment until I see the, the final reports on this. Uh, thank you. That's all for me. I had a couple of questions about the PPP and the EIDL rollout. Perhaps Secretary Carilli can let us know how many uh, companies have taken advantage of this, this, the latest program, and how much money is involved. And maybe Commissioner Pichek can tell us uh, how the uh, banks and financial institutions are rolling this out and, and how that's going. Hi, yes, this is uh, Secretary Curley. I apologize, I don't have um, good solid numbers for you for the take up on the PPP and EIDL uh, right now. Commissioner Pitek may have that, but uh, I am more than happy to connect with you after the press conference and get you those numbers. Um, yeah, that'd be great. A question to the SBA, but I can get that for you. Yeah, great, thanks. Um, maybe I'll have uh, Commissioner Pitek weigh in.
Hi, Tim. Uh, thank you um, very much for the question. Um, on the bank and the credit union side, you know, the banks and the credit unions um, similarly engaged in this round of the PPP rollout and um, did so very aggressively. You know, the, quite a few loans were um, uh, written in the early part uh, of the program's um, rollout. And Vermont, again, was ranking pretty high on a per capita basis in terms of um, the number of loans that were uh, issued uh, as of a couple of weeks ago. Um, the CD, the, uh, sorry, not the CDC, but the SBA did release an update um, just a week ago uh, on the new data, and it showed that over 3,500 loans had been taken out uh, from Vermont businesses, totaling over $300 million in this most recent round. So if you add that uh, $300 million to the $1.2 billion from the last round, that's over $1.5 billion now um, overall for Vermont businesses. So pretty, pretty effective rollout from our banks and our credit unions and a pretty good uptake from our businesses. Do you know how much um, money is available? I mean, are, is it still possible for a business to, to um, go to a, a bank or another institution and get a, a PPP or EIDL? Yeah, so at least for the PPP program, certainly there is still availability and, um, and the uh, timeline is still open. You have until March 31st. So if businesses are out there um, wondering if this is going to be a program that will work for them, certainly reach out to their bank or credit union to get more information. And again, uh, they have about six more weeks to do so. All right, great. Thank you. If I could just um, go back to Johnson Johnson for just a minute, and I'm not trying to uh, sell the product at all, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure uh, Johnson. Is, I would not be surprised, and I don't have any insight on this, but I wouldn't be surprised if Johnson Johnson is is working on uh, possibly a, a booster or second uh, vaccination or something to bring up uh, the efficacy. Um, but but as well, I mean, we have to think about again. If, if it prevents you from hospitalization and dying and gives you more mobility in a shorter period of time, uh, those are pretty good selling features of itself. So we'll see what happens with the FDA and what the approval process is and what it looks like at the end of the month. But again, I think this is good news for us to get back to some uh, semblance of normal. Avery, WCAS. My question is for Secretary French. In light of the new CDC school reopening guidelines, does the state plan to follow those pretty closely, or how do you plan to implement those? We've talked with uh, Rutland City Schools, and they mentioned that they won't be able to have enough distance for, and physical distance for the students to bring them all back in the classroom if they follow those guidelines to the T. Yeah, I think, you know, firstly, it's, uh, it was useful to have the new guidance organized the way it is. I mean, it's just probably long overdue in that regard. And I will note also uh, the U.S. Department of Education issued compa companion guidance to help uh, districts with implementing it. But I think, you know, we're, we're making the observation that the guidance is really directed at those places in the country that have never reopened. Um, and I, I think it'll probably be very useful uh, for them in that regard. I think many aspects of it um, reaffirm the, the steps we've been implementing in Vermont all along. And certainly our schools, I think, have had gained a lot of experience um, in doing so, uh, so I don't. I don't think the guidance will have an immediate impact on uh, our our guidance per se. Um, I think we're going to stay where we are. I think part of that is the fact that we feel pretty comfortable that we understand uh, the conditions of our communities relative to the transmission of the virus, and that's that's um, a function of our uh, high level of testing and, of course, our surveillance testing in school itself. So, I think we're pretty confident we have a good handle on the conditions and. Um, our schools have demonstrated the ability to implement the uh, strategies that we have in place. So we feel pretty comfortable with the guidance that we have. And, and Governor, a quick question for you, not related to schools. If the Johnson & Johnson shot is approved, would you get a, it's offered to you? Um, sure. That's it. Thanks. Thanks. Hi, I was hoping um, we might be able to get a little more insight into the planning going on currently for the phase that's going to follow um, the chronic condition phase. Specifically, I'm just interested in the conversations that are being had about um, who's going to be next and, and what criteria is being considered, um, or, for example, teachers and child care providers being 
um, uh, considered. Could you just give a little insight into that discussion right now? Yeah, again, everything's on the table. We want to get through the age banding as we keep talking about. This is about taking care of those most vulnerable to death, so that's 65 and over, and then we're going to contemplate from there. Um, certainly with the Johnson Johnson coming on board, the increased number of vaccines uh, supply be, becoming more available, um, this could change our strategy. But uh, everything's on the table at this point, and we'll, uh, we'll continue to contemplate this uh, over the next uh, two to three weeks. But no, we're not re ready at this point to discuss anything about what our thoughts are. Yeah, and then another question for you, Governor. Is the um, National Guard still down in D.C., and do you think that it's time for them to come home if they are, or uh, how are you feeling about that? Yeah, they are still there, and as to whether uh, it's time for them to come home, uh, we'll await guidance from the, those in uh, Washington. Uh, we want to help. Um, we want to help those in need, and uh, we agreed. And uh, as well, did the, the Guard uh, wanted to go, uh, the Guard men and women. So um, we're, uh, we're there until they tell us that they don't need us anymore. Got it. And then one last quick one. Can we get an update on wasted doses? Do we have a, a figure um, for how many we're at right now? Uh, Secretary Smith, I don't have that. Colin, I don't have that information, but I'll get it to you. How's that? That works. Thanks. Uh, Governor, today a third of Texas is still blacked out for lack of enough backup power generation to replace the wind power that failed when the turbines froze. Three winters ago, uh, New England came within a similar uh, blackout, uh, within hours of a similar blackout. You've endorsed a New England power grid plan to build more offshore wind. Uh, given this wake-up call from Texas, are you concerned about the future reliability of New England power during emergencies as the grid relies more on wind? Um, you know, I'm concerned about our capacity as we move forward. We're moving forward with electrification uh, in, in terms of uh, what, as we reduce our need for and, uh, and usage of carbon emitting fuels. So um, we have to look at the grid in its entirety and we need a broader pro portfolio. We can't just count on one source. Uh, we want to make sure that we have uh, we have a, a substantial amount of power coming in from Canada uh, due to hydro, which I think is a good thing. Uh, but um, but we need to balance that out, and we need to to utilize uh, uh, more offshore wind if it's available, uh, as well as solar, um, as well as uh, some still nuclear. Um, so uh, again, it, you know, we want to bro broaden the portfolio to, so that we aren't depending on one source. Uh, and I think that that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's working for us thus far and we'll uh, continue uh, to, uh, to pay attention to that. Thank you. Um, also, next Saturday will be the second anniversary of uh, Chinese Consul General Fang Ping's visit with you and other state officials in Montpelier. At that time, he invited Vermont to participate in the, what he called the Belt and Road Construction, which is the 70 nation initiative led by China. Is Vermont participating in the Belt and Road Initiative, and, and in general, how would you describe um, our trade relationship with, uh, with the PRC since that meeting? Well, again, as you probably know, Guy, even before I was governor, when I was lieutenant governor, I met with many consulates and trade reps all the time from different countries, and uh, just as a courtesy. And uh, we did at this point, you know, uh, I've met with uh, officials from Israel and Canada and Great Britain, uh, Japan, Taiwan, mm -hmm. South Korea, the Netherlands, right. Mexico, France, I mean, all uh, throughout uh, the world. And these are typically just meet and greets, uh, courtesy uh, calls. And uh, we talk, you know, about some of uh, what they could uh, do for us, what we could do for them. We want to continue uh, to, to make them, uh, make us uh, more economically viable and uh, make sure that we are able to outsource what we do so well and uh and and particularly with canada you know they're our number one trading partner so they're important to us uh, but from that meeting i i don't uh, i just don't recall uh, that we're involved in anything uh 
as a as a result of that. But um, but I'll I'll check. Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm just not aware that we're part of that initiative. But I'll I'll check for you. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, Governor and perhaps uh, Secretary Smith, I'm wondering how quickly is the state able to plug in uh, additional doses into the appointment and administration pipeline? Um, for instance, the 2,500 new doses you just learned about yeah. on the call this morning. Will, will the state be able to add 2,500 additional appointments next week, um, or is there a delay in how quickly uh, we're able to utilize those? Again, that is the beauty of what we're doing with the age banding and so forth and having different phases. You know, I've seen other states who have committed to opening up uh, the, the spectrum uh, to an, a broader uh, group of people. And uh, so they're scheduling months in advance. So based on supply that they either are forecasting or they, they are getting today. Um, so. Uh, th that's a finite amount. So what we are doing uh, is able to uh, be more nimble. Uh, we're able to open up based on uh, the, the amount of vaccine we're seeing. So in this case, for instance, if we receive 2,500 more next week, uh, I'm sure we can add appointments within, you know, we're going to get through this next ban uh, in about three weeks. So uh, if, we can, uh, if we can bolster that and add more uh, along the way, we'll, we'll do it. Uh, and then we can, we'll be able to forecast from there uh, the next band. Now, the, uh, the, on the call, as I, uh, I'm just remembering now, uh, but on the call, they did talk about, uh, the White House talked about giving us maybe a little bit more down the road, maybe uh, contemplating four weeks um, and just forecasting a little bit what they're seeing uh, so that we don't do this on a week to week basis. So. Again, uh, good news for us um, and, uh, and the strategy we're using today is working and I believe we'll get through this faster without the confusion that we're seeing in other states and the cancellations that we're seeing in other states. When I see on the, on the news uh, that a certain state has had to cancel uh, their, their vaccinations for the week due to a lack of supply, you know, from my standpoint, that's just poor planning on their part. Um, when we know that there's, uh, they've committed to, to the supply we have, and again, we're keeping that tight within, within a, a few weeks, uh, then we can change that uh, for the next band. So again, I think we have an efficient process that's working for us, and we'll continue to, to monitor and make it better as we go. Thank you. Um and uh, Governor, and perhaps for Secretary French, uh, shifting gears a bit, um, media event yesterday with local school officials and some legislators uh, advocating for the adoption of the new equalized pupil weighting standards. Um, uh, just looking for your take on the issue, uh, age 54, and the phased in approach to some of the study recommendations. Uh, Secretary French. Yeah, I think I saw the coverage of that event. Um, the waiting studies, uh, the implications of it are fairly complex. And I think, you know, the, I won't say the devil's in the details, but a big part of the detail has to do with implementation and, and its overall design. So I uh, certainly look forward to working with the General Assembly on uh, understanding the complexities of the report and uh, how to situate its findings in a you know, practical way to implement it. But I think there's a lot still that needs to be done on that and that uh, it, is an, it is not a simple uh, process by any means. Do you agree with the premise that um, uh, that uh, rural students, uh, English uh, learners, um, uh, students with, who are economically challenged um, are disadvantaged by uh, the current formula? Yeah, it's, once again, it's a fairly complex uh, study and certainly um, one of the findings of the study is that the uh, weighting methodology that we currently use, um, firstly, doesn't have any real basis in an empirical model. Uh, essentially, they're, they were arbitrarily derived. Um, and in the study, as part of the, um, the charge to the authors was to uh, come up with a different weighting system. And they, they've done that based on some empirical evaluation of economic situation in the state and the region and nationally. 
but also particularly uh, for rural states, uh, some acknowledgement of the sparsity of our communities and the relative low population density. So I think, you know, there's there's a common, um, I think, uh, mistake in understanding that the weights, the weights don't necessarily uh, translate into more money for schools. Uh, they definitely translate into an incentive. But once again, it's, it's a very complex um, study, uh, definitely worthy of understanding fully and definitely worthy of figuring out um, its implications for implementation. Uh, I guess finally then, but uh, do you agree that a change to our current system needs to be made? Yes, I think, you know, that is that is sort of the uh, overarching uh, conclusion one could draw from the weighting study. Um, once again, it's uh, basically pointing that the existing weights were sort of arbitrarily derived, um, and it is pointing us to use a, a more um, say rational or empirically derived model. So uh, that's that's the conclusion. I think that's uh, hard not to acknowledge, and it's one uh, once again. I think that will require a more analysis on implementation. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Eric, the time targets. Yes, the Associated Press put out a piece last night talking about the N95 masks. What they've found is there's plenty of supply in these respirators, so much so that some companies are now exporting them. Um, but states are still dealing with uh, shortages because of a breakdown on the federal level in terms of communication. Um, is the state having any issues with N95s? Or are, they, are you guys getting as many as you want? Are there any rationing going on? I, I believe, Eric, um, that uh, we have an, uh, an inventory that is sufficient, but I might ask Commissioner Sherling if he's on, uh, if he could comment on that. I am, Governor. Uh, thanks for the question. That uh, That is accurate. We have uh, 489,000 N95 masks in the, uh, in the state's warehouse. Um, distribution has slowed uh, out of the warehouse um, in large part because uh, supplies through normal channels to healthcare facilities uh, has been bolstered in, in recent weeks. So. What that represents is uh, at our uh, worst case scenario uh, peak burn rate, uh, we have over 100 days of supply uh, of N95. And uh, is there any guidance from the state in terms of when a, an N95 has been used? I know pre pandemic, uh, it was like a single use, one mask per patient. Now, uh, because of supply issues, sometimes people wear one all day or multiple days. Is there any guidance for how long an N95 should be worn at this time? There is. The health department publishes that guidance, and I'd have to cross-check, but I do not believe we are uh, currently in conservation measures for that uh, particular piece of PPE. Okay. Thank you. And my question, um, there is a, uh, a local business that has chosen not to uh, comply with the guidelines. What does a person in the community have to do to be safe? Are there any repercussions for a company ignoring the Department of Health and CDC, CDC guidelines? Yes. Um Ed, there are repercussions if we want to first provide guidance and outreach and make sure that they understand what our guidelines are. Um, but if they just uh, refuse, as we saw in Rutland, for instance, with the uh, gym in Rutland, uh, there are repercussions. And uh, the Attorney General was involved in that one, um, and the Attorney General will be involved further. But uh, again, maybe uh, either Commissioner Sherling or Secretary Curley, one of the two. I'm happy to uh, to start, Governor, if, uh, Commissioner Sherling. If uh, if there's a business that is public facing um, that there are indications is in non-compliance, we would ask that they report that to uh, local law enforcement. Um, same would actually go uh, for businesses that are more inward facing, um, manufacturing floors, things of that nature. But in that case, we would also want to um, ensure that the Department of Labor and other regulatory entities were involved on that educational front that the governor described. 
So the the appropriate response would not be to contact um, uh, Department of Health. It would be to contact the uh, state police or other law enforcement agency. That's our primary advice. Uh, we do get a, a daily uh, report that comes from various uh, state agencies where things may get uh, reported, but uh, the health department has uh, enough going on with uh, coordinating the medical response to COVID that our preference is that you report that to law enforcement. Perfect. Thank you very much, gentlemen and ladies. <laughs> Thank you, Ed. And that's, right. and that's it. Um, thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you again on Friday.